I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the uh, Body Language Membership, the only online body language membership for body language with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I help people and companies radically transform their abilities to read and influence human behavior. I also wrote the number one best-selling book on the subject. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together a number one body language course online, bodylanguagetactics.com with Scott. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street or corporate America. All right. Today, we're going to talk about uh, Elizabeth Holmes. A lot of people are asking for that. So the panelists are. So we're going to go in. And this may be a little bit boring as we go along, but this is showing you what it looks like when somebody's just ball face cutting loose a lie. So and it's so it's from that point of view, it's really fascinating. Greg, you found these videos. Why don't you tell us a little something about them? Yeah, so a couple of one is from Fortune and one's from Wall Street Journal. This is, I believe, the Fortune is before things got really hot, and the Wall Street Journal after Wall Street Journal had exposed some of the business practices of this Theranos project. If you don't know the Theranos project, there's also a, a show called Out for Blood. I think it's on Netflix that tells the whole story. And this is Elizabeth Holmes. She's a really young a CEO who established this company. When things started to fall apart, then she was in front of everyone. And it's a really good opportunity to see how a CEO functions in terms of telling you what they want you to hear versus everything else. And if you watch her, we'll, we'll bring up those points and we'll bring up a couple of points that she does right or wrong. But people believed her. A lot of people believed that there was this one pinprick of blood they could take out of your finger, put in a little mini capsule and test you for hundreds and hundreds of disorders and diseases. That's all falling apart. She's on trial right now. And it doesn't look good for her. The last thing I heard about the trial was they're afraid they will run out of jurors because they've lost a few jurors as part of the process. And that's ongoing right now. All right. We have made it possible to do comprehensive lab tests from a prick from the finger and to eliminate the tubes and tubes of blood. Yeah. In retrospect, when you, when you look at where you are today, one test with the prick of blood, wasn't that going too far? So we, we have developed hundreds of tests over the course of the last 12 years that can run a tiny sample using proprietary Theranos technology. And part of when I talk about communicating, what we need to do is we need to get that data out there. And I've talked publicly uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks that we've made a decision now to take the data that we've generated for our FDA submissions and put it into the public domain, and we will. Yeah, but since you're focused on the one test, let's talk about why we're doing that. I have- well, And by the way, it's not just me that was focused on the one test. That was sort of the story. The Theranos story was all about this one pinprick yeah. that would let you do comprehensive blood testing. Yeah. That was the story. Yeah, well, well I, I think this is what we sort of need to dissect a little bit. So when you look at Theranos, Theranos makes devices, we make chemistries, we make consumables, we make software, and we have a little tube called a nanotainer. Which All right, Greg, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll leave the week at, you put lotion on your skin to you. I'll just leave that one alone for a minute. But so what I'll start here, she's got something in common with Chris, with Chris what was Chris's name? Chris Watts, right? Watts. Yeah, she's got something in common with Chris Watts. He had the sway rate. I'm going to coin a new phrase. She's got the head bob rate. Mm. If you watch her, this is going to be an, an, a great indicator as you see stress in her. Her fight or flight causes her to move her head more. Shorter strokes moving her head more rapidly. So you'll see that coming up as we go through this. Um, she she does way too much eye contact. Everybody makes comments about that, like she's staring you down and very low blink rate. Her blink rate increases when she gets in a bind a bit, but she does what Scott and I have referred to as romancer, where she's staring you right in the eyes to make sure how you're receiving everything when she's telling you something. And I don't have to say this, everybody who watches this show knows what chaff and redirect are. She is a master chaff and redirector. There are three kinds of CEOs, really. When you get CEOs in front of in front of an audience, there's the silent guy who's only going to answer exactly what it is that you ask because they're not going to divulge any information. That's not her. There is the um, the CEO who does chaff and redirect where they just 
blurt out a lot of stuff until you pick up on something and run. That's her. And then there's the third one. And I think Dr. Phil called it CEO-itis when I was talking to him or we were talking to him. He yeah. said, they'll sit there. And if you ask him the question three times, by the third time, they'll have figured out what the answer is and they'll answer it for you. And that was his biggest coaching thing with them. And you do see it. But watch her bobbing her head. Her <coughs> chin drops down and she breaks eye contact when he starts to attack her for the one test. Then she starts to chaff and redirect. And when she realizes he's not going to say anything, she just keeps chaffing, 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 chaffing. Her, she goes to a fairly normal blink rate and her hands illustrate when she has content that she's certain of and she's going to deliver. You'll notice that, that head bobbing slows when she does that, speeds up when she's nervous. So that's where we go. Um, I also will notice, Scott, uh, Chase, you're going to talk about pronouns. She's When she says I, she means something she's done standing in front of an audience. When she says we, she means the collective and everything they've done. And she's pretty consistent with those pronouns throughout here. So, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you, especially on the, the head movement there, uh, which we're going to talk about in a future video. I think it, uh, it becomes something it's almost ad nauseum at that point. And uh, the, the only smiles that we see are when she's speaking in a way that makes her look good. And I think this is because she wants to be seen as some kind of a visionary and not just from this one clip, but from all of her interactions, there's some very solid characteristics. Uh, if I were looking at someone like this, I would say that there is some severe narcissistic behavior. And of course, this is not a diagnosis, but the, this deliberately fake deep voice is really strange. And I think narcissists are rooted. Narcissism is rooted in insecurity. Uh, so it's feeling like my normal self is not good enough. I need to become something better and I need to gain, I need to gain my title of being the best that can only come from other people that cannot come from within a narcissist. It has to be confirmed from outside of them. So it's interesting that everything is fake. Everything is artificial. And there's two factors that come in here from the DSM. We're going to be talking a lot about the psychology of narcissism here tonight, but the, there's grandiosity and superficial charm or what, what they call glibness in, in some of these uh, diagnostic criteria. Then there's even paranoia in here, which would suggest something different, which I guarantee you Scott's going to talk about in a bit. And she's even admitted to it. Uh, she's logged into her employees' private data, looking at their accounts, cameras all over the place. There's bulletproof glass in her office. There's bodyguards, all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm just going to stop there. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, man. This is this is one of my favorites so far because it's in two of my wheelhouses, psychopathy and startups. <laughs> so uh, and a lot of a lot of psychopaths end up being CEOs. You know, we come to find out not that all of them are. If you got lawyers, hold on over there. I'm not saying you are. I'm not pointing anybody out, but it just so happens there are a lot of them in there. Um, right out of the gate, she's overselling with that body language, man. She's she's nervous because she knows this guy, his delivery is so just slow and just ding, ding. She knows she's, she's going to be in a little bit of trouble. So she starts this thing where she's trying to make everything okay. But you guys nailed this so far. She got that head to bobbing, the body moving around, trying to... And that sort of gets your attention off of what she's saying as you try as she's trying to get you to agree with her. Um, and uh, what she does is this classic setup she does when she sits down, she crosses her leg, she puts her arm up as a, as a barrier. And sometimes you'll see her squeeze her ankle or her, the bottom part of her leg as an adapter, which we'll see here in a little while. Uh, she, and again, she uses we a lot when she's talking about all the things that, that the company has done. But then she gets down to a lot of eyes here. And a little, I just winked. I can't believe I'm a winker. Anyway, she gets down to a lot of eyes in a few minutes, just talking about her and these wonderful things she's done. Uh, totally nar narcissistic in a, a small way compared to what the way, the way it's going to get in a few minutes. Um, the interviewer, he talks really loud, and she's trying to talk loud too, but she's still trying to keep that fake low voice. So she's trying to talk low, and she's trying to talk loud. And when you talk loud, more air comes out, and your voice is going to go higher, so it sounds odd because you're still trying to keep it low. You'll, you'll realize what that as we go through this and you make comparisons about what she sounds like now when her voice is about in the middle and then we're going to hear what she's talking really low. So it's, it, this is, this is a freak show as we go along. She doesn't answer the questions yes or no. She never says yes or no. Never once does she do that in here. And she, you're right, Greg, just, just the master of chaff and redirect. Um, 
what else? She, now she, she's got this thing um, that, that, that I'm going to call the protective slouch. Is the more trouble she gets in, the more she sees she's in trouble, the, the smaller she gets when someone's getting ready to rob someplace, they're getting ready to steal something, or they're sneaking around, they'll make themselves smaller. A lot of times we'll call it turtling because their head will go down their sho- and their sho- shoulders will come up. In this case, she's just starting to, her posture just gets horrendous. And this is just like she turns almost into the hunchback woman. And, and we'll see it even more as we go along. She starts out tall, and she starts getting smaller and smaller. She goes along and, and keeps feeding what she knows is not true. Um, I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so she's she's raised a chair up, so she has height dominance over this uh, person. And uh, and so um, part, of, part of her slouch is to try and redress some of that uh, height dominance. I think at, at, at times we will see her later kind of straighten up uh, often when her interviewer straightens up as well as some kind of battle commences. I have to say, you know, we're going to have to be careful here around or certainly I want to be careful here around what part of these behaviours are culture and what might be um, psychopathy. Um, because, look, yes, you're right. Um, th- uh, about 13 percent of um, of CEOs will test uh, a, a psychopathic on the hair test. 15 percent of inmates inmates, male inmates in a in a prison uh, will test the same. So um, given that, uh, it is quite a high proportion of psychopathy um, in business. It's still not massive, though, is it? It's still not huge, but it's close to a prison population, uh, strangely enough. Uh, however, some of the f- the f- the organization of business can be, from many people's point of view, fairly antisocial and therefore, uh, and cause antisocial behavior. And therefore, sometimes it's not the personality of the person involved, it's the structure around them that causes the impression of psychopathy. Now, uh, in her particular case, uh, she's, look, it's not it's not fashionable to be wearing a polo neck at this point. That was fashionable back in the kind of, I guess, as I remember it, kind of the early 90s, I think. And, and yeah, you know, the CEO of, of Apple was wearing polo necks and she's mirroring that kind of look. Well, why? Because there aren't, in, in at this point in Silicon Valley, there aren't a lot of good examples and role models to go, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. You, you, you too can look like a, a, a billionaire Silicon Valley um, titan of, of industry. Well, understand, she is being a titan at this point. She's, she's the youngest female um, billionaire on paper uh, within Silicon Valley at the moment. She is quite unique. Her investors, her major investor is the Walton family, the richest family in the world, uh, you know, to make the the Saudi um, uh, royal family that have only got half the wealth of the Waltons. And they've, they've, they own a country and have a country named after them. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, so she has some incredibly rich in investors on her board, by the way. Oh, by the way, Murdoch is an, is an investor. Uh, um, it's in the Daily Mail. We always love that. Um, uh, Henry Kissinger on the board, George Schultz on the board, James Matis uh, on the board. Um, so an incredibly powerful board and, and group of financiers and backers around her. So just like females in the past who get into that position, she has lowered a voice. This is not abnormal. Margaret Thatcher, great example. Lowered, lowered her voice, right? You always love it when I do Thatcher impersonation. And there she is uh, in all her glory. Um, so, so she's lowered her voice. Um, she's aggressive. The head is tilted down. Um, uh, um, lots of press down of the finger, lots of hands down. So a lot of what I'm seeing, I think, is not actually particularly abnormal for somebody at her power level who's new to it or CEOs in general. There, that's all I got for you. That was quite long, Excellent. wasn't it? Oh, that's good. We have made it possible to do comprehensive lab tests from a prick from the finger and to eliminate the tubes and tubes of blood. Yeah. In retrospect, when you when you look at where you are today, one test with the prick of blood, wasn't that going too far? So we, we have developed hundreds of tests over the course of the last 12 years that can 
run a tiny sample using proprietary Theranos technology. And part of when I talk about communicating, what we need to do is we need to get that data out there. And I've talked publicly uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks that we've made a decision now to take the data that we've generated for our FDA submissions and put it into the public domain, and we will. Uh, but since you're focused on the one test, let's talk about why we're doing that. I have... Well, and by the way, it's not just me that was focused on the one test. That was sort of the story. The Theranos story was all about this one pinprick that would let you do comprehensive blood testing. Yeah. That was the story. Yeah, well, well I, I think this is what we sort of need to dissect a little bit. So when you look at Theranos, Theranos makes devices. We make chemistries, we make consumables, we make software, and we have a little tube called a nanotainer. Which Good. All right. This has well, nothing to well, do with uh, the now, now you're confusing me. How many tests are you doing right now yeah. from a simple pin prick, as you described in that TED Talk? Yeah, so right now, just because of this FDA transition, one. we're only doing one. Okay. Thing, right? Okay. But that so. doesn't mean that we don't have the technology to do them or that we haven't done them in the past. And are you confident that you will get the FDA approval to do the 200 that are a standard part of the, the draw? Well, we've... So there's, there's multiple parts to this. One is the validation of those tests under the lab framework. The other one is the FDA submission. And this is an area of evolving policy that we're working to create a leadership position in. We've never talked publicly about what the status of what we're doing with FDA is because we just hadn't felt that was appropriate um, until we got into all of this recent press communications. But um, we're incredibly confident in the data that we've submitted to the agency. We've worked on it for two years, and we've met the standard of comparing our tubes to vacutainers, which are the big tubes that come from the arm. And we're hopeful uh, that we'll see, we'll see those. So you feel soon. confident that that vision you laid out nine months ago will still happen, that you'll be able to do comprehensive tests from a single prick? Absolutely, and we've done it in the past, and we're going to continue to do it in the future. All right. Chase, what do you got? This nonstop head nodding. I want you to watch while she's being asked the question and her head never stops moving. This is her nervous gesture, but I think this is a habitual thing that she's developed to, to interact with people and to just gain some kind of rapport and get somebody on board. She's been very good at getting somebody on board. And I think that the way she's able to dupe all of these investors was to get a couple of big fish and let their credibility speak for themselves, speak for itself. But uh, she had to get them. She still had to get a couple of people. And I think this is one of those behaviors that she learned, which is uh, extremely unusual uh, behavior. She throws up a stop gesture. And a stop gesture is when all of your fingers extend, even if you're like uh, making food in the kitchen, you're listening to this in the background, just try it out. Like if your fingers stretch out all the way, that's what's going to happen if you're trying to stop someone from doing something, you're trying to talk someone out of something, even if your hand's in your pocket or down at your side or in your purse, our hands will extend outward when we're trying to talk someone out of something or get them to stop. So, and this is right when she's answering or about to answer the technology question. Do you have the technology to do all these tests? So we've now seen her nodding her head and head shaking is indicative of agreement or disagreement. We know she shakes her head no for disagreement and yes for agreement. And she doesn't really want to confirm anything, uh, only confirming the negatives of like what's not there and what's not present there. And she's making this uh, like container shape with her hands to illustrate these different levels or these different parts. And it shows she's most likely a kinesthetic person, which she uses feeling words, which would be like if I was interrogating her, I would start transitioning into constructing my language that way. But she continues to use these team pronouns of us, our, we, when referring to the company. And it's interesting. I want you to see when she starts using self-referential pronouns and exactly precisely when. We're going to dissect that here in just a second. But people are going to use more team pronouns when they're speaking about something they don't want to fully own. And yes, CEOs are going to do this all the time. But when they're asked direct questions about themselves, this was a direct question about her personally. 
and she starts answering with team pronouns, that's when it becomes unusual. Uh, when she says we're hopeful, her hand kind of tosses out. And when she finally confirms that she's confident about it, she says the words, absolutely. And she's shaking her head. No, it is a good data point here because we have established a baseline. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that there is this agreement behavior, just as you say that chase which i think she has evolved she's learned she may have been trained a little bit as well in you know how do you get people on board but it, but it is so consistent and so over the top and i think you know ultimately i think as you were saying uh, greg and, and scott and, and and chase it's it's going to evolve into i think almost a self-soothing gesture in the end it's so it's so consistent and and ramps up um uh, use of the detailed finger gestures there just nice to see it's a great one to be able to use let people know look look how big my brain is you know because because monkeys can't can't do that monkeys can do can do this so the moment you start being more detailed with your fingers you know the brain kind of sparks up in the in the neocortex for your audience and they get really interested in what you're doing so again it's a nice way to convince people is to be really delicate and fine with those gestures um hyperbole exaggeration in there which potentially could speak to business speak but also speak to uh potential narcissism psychopathy it's it's one of the elements that you you might look for um in 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 both of those because she says uh well you know this is in uh there's multiple parts to this um well then she comes up with two parts so so it's, it's a multiple of two then isn't it there was only one part we thought and there's another part I, I would say multiple parts would be like potentially three or more i'd be looking for five you know just to kind of build it out a little bit no multiple parts two uh so that i would be i'd say is hyperbole and then she goes um in an element of it uh hopeful there's a little gap then an uh we don't see from her very much during this and we get a little kind of micro duck of the head uh, on that can't remember what the question is but i think it's about the veracity of the results that they get or the or the technology uh hopefully uh duck of the head at that point i would be going short on this stock it's not a public company uh so i'd have no way of doing this it's all private uh investors so you know ultimately this is not really hurting the the, the public as an as investors, uh, it's incredibly, incredibly rich families are involved uh, in this. Uh, but it is hurting the public in terms of uh, their faith in medical equipment. I think that's the real issue here. Uh, hopeful uh, duck of the head. At that point, I would be going, no, this doesn't look good at all. I don't like what I'm seeing there. Greg, what do you, Greg, what do you, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so. <clears throat> I start off by saying even the interviewer sees her sleight of hand and her chaff and redirect. So he starts to put her on notice and he says, you're confusing me with and her head bob rate starts to increase. So I teach people that when you're listening to an argument, if you nod quietly, the person will divulge information. I don't teach them to do this constantly like the dog in the window, you know, little um, bobblehead dogs or that kind of thing that you get. We always say that organism does what makes organism successful. She rose to prominence by being among people and persuading them. Now, if they fell for that in the beginning and she shook her head a little and that just continued, then she would evolve and she would do more of that. And she surrounded herself with experts. And I always say one way to make yourself an expert is by association. If I hang out with the right experts, then I'm an expert too. And people fall for that. It just works that way. If you watch her, when he asks her how many tests, she grips her hand. You also watch that her hands only come up and speak when she is certain of what she's going to say. Her hands stop otherwise. Chase, I love the fact you caught her doing absolutely when she says that only for negative things otherwise. And you can see that she's falling apart there. She's doing this romancer thing we talk about by staring you right in the eyes as she dumps a lot of chaff. And then her head does become an illustrator. One of the few times she uses her head to make her point when she's talking about the FDA. She is shrinking. To your point, Scott, she's shrinking in that chair and getting smaller and smaller by the minute. And she's using something that I call insulator, or we call insulator in the True Crime Workshop, because she is using jargon that you have to dissect. 
she's talking about micro containers and, and vacuum containers, whatever she's talking about there. She's using that not only as a piece of jargon, but she even explains what she means by it just so that she can burn up more airtime. This is a, a way for her to burn up space. And the last thing I'll leave you with is I've been in business a long time and work with a lot of business leaders. Words like hopeful, believe. I always say to people who are leaders, those are church words, not business words. Think, know, understand are business words. So anytime I hear those from somebody and all the way from teaching project managers, all the way up to partners who are CEOs and that, I would say, don't use those words. Those do not instill confidence. So that's what I see. I would not believe her. And I'm with you, Mark. I would have been like, hold on, red, red flag, red flag. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, she feels the news tightening at this point. So, she, again, she's getting, as she gets a little bit more stress and, and this guy's a little bit loud, well, that, that voice starts, that throat starts to constrict a little bit, and she's trying to keep it low, but it's, it's staying in the middle, and it's what makes her voice sound so odd at this point. And she starts adapting using that ankle. And her, her regulator, uh, you're right, Chase, when she comes out and puts that, that hang on a minute, trying to get control of what's going on because it's getting away from her. She, she's, she's, she's bobbing and weaving at this point. Um, now, there's small, her illustrators are small when she gets into that because of the FDA um, transition and all that, they get really small because she's thinking, 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 how am I going to get out of this? I can't, I can't believe anybody would, would, would buy this at this. I mean, I train people how to look for this when they're talking to um, entrepreneurs, the VCs that are all going and watch for this. And I've trained so many. I can't believe that that she got past this, which makes me think there's other people with her. It's not just her. There's other people that have, that have helped make this happen, knowing it was at the same time. They had to have known that. They had to have known that. Again, you you guys are right. Like the Wicked Witch of the West, man, she's getting smaller and smaller as she goes along. In the second half, her illustrators are big again. You know, and she's... Um, and she, and she comes out in that, after that second question, swinging for the damn fences, man. She's coming on hard with that. Just so, she's just going for it. Um, but her barrier arm and that thing stays strong. She's right there, barrier, barriered in, and she's just and she's going with it. So I, I can't, I can't get, I cannot believe somebody would would believe this. Of course, we know what to look for, but still, there I know for a fact there are people like us that help uh, VCs look at the, at these people. I can't believe that that she got this far with this. I'm dumbfounded. By, by this and anybody would believe it even hearing it now somebody didn't stand up in the audience and go hey wait a minute man that's it has you know there's no way you could i can't believe that didn't happen this has nothing well, to do well, with uh, now, now you're confusing me how many tests are you doing right now yeah. from a simple pin prick as you described in that ted talk yeah so right now just because of this fda transition what we're only doing one okay thing, right Okay. But that so, doesn't mean that we don't have the technology to do them or that we haven't done them in the past. And are you confident that you will get the FDA approval to do the 200 that are a standard part of the, the draw? Well, we've, so there's, there's multiple parts to this. One is the validation of those tests under the lab framework. The other one is the FDA submission. And this is an area of evolving policy that we're working to create a leadership position in. We've never talked publicly about what the status of what we're doing with FDA is because we just hadn't felt that was appropriate um, until we got into all of this recent press communications. But um, we're incredibly confident in the data that we've submitted to the agency. We've worked on it for two years. And we've met the standard of comparing our tubes to vacutainers, which are the big tubes that come from the arm. And we're hopeful uh, that we'll see we'll see those. So you feel confident that that vision you laid out nine months ago will still happen? That you'll be able to do comprehensive tests from a single prick? Absolutely, and we've done it in the past, and we're going to continue to do it in the future. I can't believe what you're going to say, Greg. Yeah. So a few things. We're using a lot of language in here, assuming that everyone knows what we're talking about. Illustrators. I'm illustrating and punctuating what my brain is thinking, either word, phrase, or thought. Um, barriers. I'm putting something between me and you. Adapters, I'm rubbing my hands, I'm gripping my leg, I'm doing that. And then finally, regulators, and you're going to see her use them a lot. Regulators, stop, hold on, wait, go ahead, speed up, stop, all those kinds of things that we use. So those four things, guys, we need to remind everybody because not everyone has watched us many times. All you new subscribers, this is for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, please subscribe. <laughs> if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. <laughs> 
This has nothing well, to do well, with our uh, tests. Now, now you're confusing me. How many tests are you doing right now yeah. from a simple pin prick, as you described in that TED Talk? Yeah, so right now, just because of this FDA transition, one. we're only doing one. Okay. Thing, right? Okay. But that so. doesn't mean that we don't have the technology to do them or that we haven't done them in the past. And are you confident that you will get the FDA approval to do the 200 that are a standard part of the, the draw? Well, we've, so there's, there's multiple parts to this. One is the validation of those tests under the lab framework. The other one is the FDA submission. And this is an area of evolving policy that we're working to create a leadership position in. We've never talked publicly about what the status of what we're doing with FDA is because we just hadn't felt that was appropriate um, until we got into all of this recent press communications. But um, we're incredibly confident in the data that we've submitted to the agency. We've worked on it for two years. And we've met the standard of comparing our tubes to vacutainers, which are the big tubes that come from the arm. And we're hopeful uh, that we'll see, we'll see those. So you feel confident that that vision you laid out nine months ago will still happen, that you'll be able to do comprehensive tests from a single prick? Absolutely. And we've done it in the past, and we're going to continue to do it in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? I'm the business leader. Now, you're, you're, one of your business partners, of course, was Walgreens, which has publicly said they've, they're stopping expansion to new stores of Theranos, which is only in Arizona right now, right? Well, they haven't said that to us, uh, but they have not said that, that to you. Not, not to us, no. So you still expect to to build out to uh, Walgreens stores? Well, we're talking with them, and we were at a point in which we'd completed our rollout in Phoenix, and we're looking at what the next steps in that relationship are. They've they've been a great partner with us in the context of our work in Phoenix. Do you think, given what you know now about your your technology and the regulatory challenges and so forth, do you think this company is a $9 billion company? Well, I think that's for investors to decide. But so far, no problem? Do you have all the money you need to get through this uh, tough period? Absolutely. You have no problem with financing? Well, I mean, that's a very loaded term. We're definitely not <laughs> in a position in which we need to raise capital right now. <laughs> uh, we have very... All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so for me now, she's heavily into that head nodding. I think it's become, uh, for me, more of a pacifier than a, a rhetorical technique of engaging people. Uh, but guys, you know, let me know what you think about, about that one. For me, it's a pacifier now. Um, she creates what I would call, instead of a word salad, it's a word lasagna, because there's so many layers <laughs> to it. There's just so many, you know, and you, you eat some pan, you get some meat, and then there's some bechamel sauce, and like, it's, there's so many layers to it. But net-net at the end of whatever she says there in that word la lasagna, I think net-net is probably not. Whatever, whatever is asked, net-net is Probably not. I think it's, um, you know, are they going to work with Walgreens a a anymore? And the Walgreens tell you they're out. I think as you go down the lasagna, it's like, yeah, they're not. They're not going to do that. Um, when the, um, I'll let investors decide. I see lip retraction on that. So there's concern. I think there's already concern that the investors are getting upset about this very powerful uh, investors she has she has there who would probably if they were duped probably get quite upset because it's not that they can't afford it i mean they can totally afford it they can totally afford it but they don't like being being made to look like idiots okay they don't or they've got so much money that they just don't care and they can blow it they can, remember this is an 8 billion dollar company on paper, it didn't cost the investors eight billion. Okay. It didn't cost them anywhere near eight billion. The 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 eval the evaluation of this is massive compared to the initial I I investment uh, of people, which wasn't much for them, but it makes them look a little bit silly. Like you say, Scott, you know, why can't they see that this is vaporware? Well, you know, it takes lying is a very important social skill and the world of investment is a is a society, especially when it comes to these uber wealthy family offices. And so and so to tell a lie, you need to lie and you need somebody who's going to accept that lie. Because as, as Scott was saying there, I don't know why anybody's not going. I don't accept that. That's clearly vaporware. That's nonsense. Well, if you're part of that 
of that family office situation, you need you need these kind of deals to show up every now and again, and you need one of them every now and again to be true because you missed out straight away on Amazon. You miss and understand they sit around dinner tables going, hey, did were you an early investor in company X? No. Okay, they want to be able to say they got in super early on something because they're smarter than all the rest. Um, but listen, you know, on the whole, um, <laughs> apart from her head, apart from her head, she's quite still and controlled in a lot of her uh, body. And I think that's because, you know, as you, as you said there, Scott, you know, she's hanging on to that leg for dear life. She's hanging on to other parts of her body and really kind of knuckling down there. Bit of a white knuckle ride, but that head is is going crazy on that. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? This reminds me of that quote from Caddyshack when Chevy Chase talks about betting against Rocky in the, uh, <laughs> in the movie. And then he, he follows up with, yeah. Hindsight's 2020, my friend. Right. So uh, I want you to try to see how many times you can spot her using the word I in this clip. When we roll it again, I want you to see how many times she owns anything. Six. And I think it's continuously awkward how she's just nodding her head. And we're starting to see the first signs of, of nervousness here. Talking about Walgreens, just closing her hand onto her wrist. There's some uh, nervous adapting movement here. Uh, at is your company worth nine billion dollars? Right arms going crazy. The lips tighten up. There's chin chin boss movement there. And do you have all the money you need to get through all of this? We see a lot more here. We see digital flexion. We see more tight lips. We see nervousness. Uh, we and we see uh, the classic super mega fake fake smile. I think that's the scientific name for that. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so she starts off with that head bob rate again is fairly fast, but it speeds up, and, and it's not a nod; it's a bob. I mean, her whole body is lean forward, so her head is bobbing and moving weird, you know, like a woodpecker or something. I guess is the best way to look at it. We could we could create a new name for it. Of course, she's probably the only person we're ever going to see do it. So. Mm -hmm. There's that. But she grams her leg, and I agree with you, Mark. It's become an adapter, a way to release nervous energy is all it is, because it increases as she feels more nervous and decreases as she feels less nervous. You'll also watch that she illustrates with her hands when she starts to talk about Arizona. You can see she is very uncomfortable. Her chin drops. She shrinks even more when it gets to the Walgreens thing. And then she doesn't answer the question. She says they haven't said that to us. Later, we'll hear her say there's a specific way she expects communication from customers, and I would guess the same thing from vendors. She's controlling the conversation in this case. Her hands illustrate when she's confident on that message around Arizona, but there are no illustrators at all around, is your company worth $9 billion? She redirects quickly and says, well, it's not for me to decide, it's for somebody else. She does a nervous smile and lip compression, slight, but still lip compression. Then as the question comes, do you have enough finances? She parses the question. I'm going to reframe the question and answer however I want. Well, that could mean lots of things. Well, no, it means one thing. Do you have enough money to run this business? That means something very specific. What she was wanting is a question about liquidity or something very pointed, and she would have answered that question. This is that CEO technique about only answer what you're asked. If you don't frame the question well, I'm not going to give you the answer. Scott, what do you got? <laughs> Damn. okay sorry okay anyway if you have a company and you have a valuation of nine billion dollars and you act like she's acting you would see that as an outsider and go hey man something's not right here something's not right here there's a guy named michael bircham and he was the ceo of the nashville entrepreneur center he could smell this just things just like this from a mile away and back to your point mark about how it's a it's a social thing uh, there's a social uh component to investors and vcs and things for example in in nashville most of everybody knows everybody and there's a specific uh there, there are groups and cliques but everybody knows everybody you go to boston it's the same thing everybody knows everybody and washington same thing texas you get out to uh in, anywhere in the u.s you, you, that that is known as an investing city uh, where they do those where they do that they have groups social groups 
And when you get in there and somebody starts talking like this, this guy, Michael Burcham, no matter who it was in the group, would go, not nah, this isn't right, because one person will say, all right, I'm getting into this. What do you guys think? And they'll all say, here's why I don't, here's why it doesn't look good to me or whatever. They're very guarded with that. And I agree with the mark on the part where everybody wants to have that that one hit, but they all want to make sure they make their their 10 to 20x return on that. So it's 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 something you have to be talked into it. That if you don't believe in it, you have to be shown some stuff that's just like unbelievable. However, in this case, I think what's happened is she's gotten some big names right out of the gate. And those guys, and people say, okay, he's into it, it must work. And from that one, that one on is when the, the, the dominoes start falling from that, whoever that first person was, that's what made him fall. I don't know who it is, no clue. But mark my words, that's, that's your key there, getting that first person. Because that's when they kept saying, yeah, when you get into this. Another, I hate to keep talking about Michael Burcham, but one thing he always crammed into my mind was CEOs are always looking for, for funding. They're always looking for money. Always. If you have a valuation of $9 billion, you try to get another $9 billion. You know, you don't say, now we have enough money. You never say that. I can't believe she said that. I can't believe somebody didn't go, oh no, we messed up. This isn't working. The part where she talks about being in Phoenix in, in the Walmart and they have this big relationship there, that may be. But but any of us could get a relationship with Whole Foods for a new drink or a new uh, health bar that we have because they're real good at helping entrepreneurs get started. So you can have it in that one town at that one store and say, I'm part of Whole Foods. I'm in there. So when they're in Phoenix, it didn't work. That's why they're, they're saying, nope, because they gave her a test and the test failed They when they tested it in that market. She was saying they could do all these tests and things. This is why I think it goes down to psychopathy as well, because she did not care about the health of these people. If they had cancer, if they had diabetes, whatever they had, she didn't give a about any of that. She just kept saying, yeah, this works, this works, you know, and keeps, and to make money. So that's my number one bell and whistle and red flag about why I go down the psychopathy road for her because normal people do not do that. Wouldn't give, wouldn't treat the masses and, and say, I hear you, you're not sick when they didn't know if you are or not. So I'm getting all worked up, but this is just, I can't believe these people invested in this, listening to her at this point and go, do you need our money out of that? I'm the business leader. No, you're, you're, one of your business partners, of course, was Walgreens, which has publicly said they've, they're stopping expansion to new stores of Theranos, which is only in Arizona right now, right? Well, they haven't said that to us, yeah, but- They have not said that, that to you? Not, not to us, no. So you still expect to, to build out to uh, Walgreens stores? Well, we're talking with them, and we were at a point in which we'd completed our rollout in Phoenix, and we're looking at what the next steps in that relationship are. They've, they've been a great partner with us in the context of our work in Phoenix. Do you think, given what you know now about your, your technology and the regulatory challenges and so forth, do you think this company is a $9 billion company? Well, I think that's for investors to decide. But so far, no problem? Do you have all the money you need to get through this uh, tough period? Absolutely. You have no problem with financing? Well, I mean, that's a very loaded term. We're definitely not in a position in which we need to raise capital right now. <laughs> uh, we have very... So, I want to jump in. Um, you've said that the journal's reporting on Theranos has been erroneous and, quote, grounded in baseless assertions. Could you get specific on the key points today and, and um, starting with whether you're now at the point where you're only testing for one thing, herpes, using your proprietary technology? Is that correct? It's not correct. Um, okay. And there's a lot of different elements of our work that have been conf uh, conflated through these two pieces. Um, the decision that we made to voluntarily submit all of our tests and test systems to FDA uh, meant that we have to move as a company from the lab framework and quality systems to the FDA framework and quality systems. And our specific recent announcements around what we're doing with our nanotainer tube have to do only with the tube that we use to collect capillary or finger stick blood mm -hmm. and the decision that we made to take those tubes through the FDA clearance process. We've submitted 
all of our filings around those nanotainer tubes, that nanotainer was actually cleared by the FDA for use with our devices and software and first test that we took through the FDA for HSV. And now we're taking it through for use with any combination of tests. So once you submit those submissions, at a certain point, if you're going to transition from operating under the CLIA lab framework to the FDA framework to be compliant with the use of those nanotainers as an FDA regulated device, you have to move to the FDA quality systems. And that's what we've just done. So, and but at this moment in time, then, you're not using... All right, Greg, what do you got? So she starts off leaning back in the chair relatively with her, her legs open, which I'm surprised. You know, she's not sitting in her normal cross-legged fashion. But then the minute the threat comes, she turns, puts her legs that way and grips that ankle. That's her, that's her go-to-war bat. That's the way she's set. She turns in the chair and we can see her nodding her head. This looks like data intake, like I'm listening and doing the right thing, not the boom, 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 boom move that she was doing earlier. Um, at, this is not correct. When he brings up a point and she says, this is not correct. You see her tilt her head, draw her chin down, and look out from under her brow in that taffy pulling move as if she's finding out exactly what the threat is. Then she goes into an uncharacteristic stammer as she begins her redirect. Her hands show that she's prepped work, and she speeds up at one point as she starts this chaff and redirect. She speeds up enough that it looks like she's prepared for the answer. This is one that her people have prepared her for and she should answer this way. You see her forehead get smooth and then she talks about framework and if you wanna know whether this is her normal voice or not, she says framework twice. Listen to the second one. That's her normal voice, the deep power framework and then the framework goes up as she's asking for approval. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right, you're right. Uh, she's got that knee up. Uh, she completely changes when when she starts when she starts feeling the heat from this guy and this is a completely different style of of uh interviewing this guy as compared to the guy we just saw so she's matching and marrying this guy as hard as she can she's talking really slow and really and and doing things so because he's talking really slow and lower so she's doing she's doing the same thing there um gosh there's so much here nobody ever says to her are you lying if this guy had said, are you lying about any of this? No, I don't know why somebody doesn't ask her about that. Just, it's just, sorry, I'm all over the place on this because she's on my last nerve. She got on my nerves when I was watching, but now that we're talking about it as a group, man, it's really bothering me. Um, let's see, what have I got? I got I got two pages worth of stuff here. I'm just going to do a rant like I did last time. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> oh man there you go there he is that was man profound, you were I'm selling sure. it in there too man you were leaning into it too i, too, I, was like, I hope you can oh, you were, reproduce wow. whatever that was because oh, that was good wow was probably that good that was good i don't know what i was saying wow. all right wow <laughs> i don't either i'm not sure i want to know yeah, man. All You're right. giving Scott hell for being so wound up about <laughs> about poor Elizabeth. Uh, wow. All right. Chase, what do you got? Watch her head nodding crazily through this entire question here at the beginning. And she's still unable to speak about herself, even though the questions, many of these questions are directed at her. And I've studied charisma and and persuasion influence my whole life. It's what I teach to intelligence people. And I firmly believe that she is copying the behavioral patterns and vocal patterns of Barack Obama. And I think she's trying to copy this cadence and tone and just not, not thinking about like charisma doesn't come from just copying some basic stuff like that. And I think there's, 
she's it's the same style of illustration with her hands but i want to talk about narcissism just a little bit more and i'm going to just keep peppering this in throughout the video uh exaggerates achievements this is one of the top diagnostic criteria for narcissism preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success or some kind of unlimited power it's another big one for narcissism uh what about a person that believes that they're unique and should only hang out with special and unique people slash investors requires excessive admiration or dresses like a former Apple CEO. Okay. That's not, that's not in the, the criteria, but I made that one up. <laughs> uh, interpersonally exploitative, like takes advantage of or uses people in that person's life. They're envious of others. They lack empathy, like Scott was just talking about, and shows arrogant behavior or attitudes. So these are some hallmarks of clinical narcissism. And when someone says clinical before the name of any psychiatric or psychological illness, that means it requires or is needing treatment, some kind of therapeutic uh, intervention for this. Uh, so... Obviously, I, I'm not diagnosing anybody with a disorder here, but these are some of the hallmarks. And if you happen to see those here in this video, then I would say that you have equal access to make your own judgment. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So, so I think just as everybody's saying, body language uh, has kind of just ramped up here from a lot of what we saw in the in the, in the first place. So let me uh, hit on that. We see we hear a vocal click. A little click in there or i haven't heard that from her before and so i'm a little bit worried uh, about that and then we get a nice big eyebrow raise on the idea of compliant and i want to focus on this because i think ultimately this is her strategy around getting uh, or, or, or suspending the ramifications of this vaporware that has been created in that she's going to blame FDA compliance as the hurdle for this technology not performing as it should perform. And we'll see this play out down the line. And I think that's why we get that lovely big eyebrow raise on that. He wants this. I think he's the he's the tech editor of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he, she's looking for buy in on that. Now, he very definitely has a has a horse in the race because the argument will will come that the Wall Street Journal have just plain old uh, been lying uh, about her. She doesn't call them a liar, but she gets close. She gets close. And what a great maneuver. I mean, that is a really lovely maneuver, because just as uh, you know, you've been saying, guys, you know, why? Why doesn't this guy just go, look, you're a liar? Um, he's being polite, I think. <laughs> That's the thing He's being polite. There's a whole, you know, there's some politics uh, involved here, potentially being polite. She is more aggressive, less polite. And very soon she will really lay down what she thinks about Wall Street Journal. That's all I got on that one. I think we're all done on that, aren't we? Oh, Greg, have you got, have you been? Greg? No, I, I think there's something to add, guys. No, I, I'm burning mm. good in mind. I think there's something to add, yeah. something the two of you brought up. The more you, a person behaves in some unique fashion or eccentric, the less likely people are to go after them because then they're considered bullies and beating them up. And she's got this image she's built that is all this low talking, mm -hmm. Steve Jobs dressing, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, it, nobody jumped on her. I think that's part of her facade and part of her defense. Mm. Mm. So I want to jump in. Um, you've said that the journal's reporting on Theranos has been erroneous and, quote, grounded in baseless assertions. Mm -hmm. Could you get specific on the key points today and, and um, starting with whether you're now at the point where you're only testing for one thing, herpes, using your proprietary technology. Is that correct? It's not correct. Um, okay. And there's a lot of different elements of our work that have been conf uh, conflated through these two pieces. Um, the decision that we made to voluntarily submit all of our tests and test systems to FDA uh, meant that we have to move as a company 
from the lab framework and quality systems to the FDA framework and quality systems. And our specific recent announcements around what we're doing with our nanotainer tube have to do only with the tube that we use to collect capillary or finger stick blood mm -hmm. and the decision that we made to take those tubes through the FDA clearance process. We've submitted all of our filings around those nanotainer tubes. That nanotainer was actually cleared by the FDA for use with our devices and software and first test that we took through the FDA for HSV. And now we're taking it through for use with any combination of tests. So once you submit those submissions, at a certain point, if you're going to transition from operating under the CLIA lab framework to the FDA framework to be compliant with the use of those nanotainers as an FDA regulated device, you have to move to the FDA quality systems. And that's what we've just done. So, and but at this moment in time then, you're not using... Her? So if I went to one of the centers and I got mm -hmm. a pinprick mm -hmm. um, and I only gave that much blood, mm -hmm. right? What tests are yeah. you currently able to perform for that blood using anything other than commercially available lab equipment? So we have never used commercially available lab equipment for finger stick based tests. Okay. Every finger stick test that we have ever done uses proprietary Theranos technology that is not commercially available. Okay. Um, right now, because we're at a moment in time in which we've decided to transition from the lab framework to the FDA framework, I think about this kind of like if you have cars driving on a road and you say, okay, I'm gonna take everybody from driving on the right-hand side of the road to the left-hand side of the road, the only way to do that is to pause, right? Okay. Cut over, and so as a result, because we have voluntarily decided not to use our nanotainer tubes until we cut over to the left-hand side of the road, which we now have the FDA quality systems in place to do this, yeah, I'm, we are not collecting the finger stick sample for anything except for HSV. That okay. has nothing to do with what we can run on our devices in our lab. Okay. It has nothing to do with our tests. It has nothing to do with our testing methodology or the accuracy or performance of it. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, so I'm just going to say uh, two things here. Um, uh, I, I, the lot of suppression gestures now, uh, which I, which you know, I think you guys would call um, uh, regulators, and they're, they're, and, and I would call moderators because these specific regulators are about her moderating the conversation and just saying, "Look, stop that." I think she's really on the back foot now. She wants this to to stop because he's been really specific about that. He's literally going, "Well, if I get a pin and I prick and a little bit of blood, like, what can you actually do with that?" He's he's managed to narrow it down. Down. And so she's now got to explode it up now, got to reject his his premise and explode it up into some kind of word lasagna in order that we won't be able to see where where the lies are, uh, essentially. So um, uh, lots of nods, lots of looks to approval, nothing, nothing new there. Uh, the, the only other thing I'd say is there's a lovely, for her, quite big downturn of the mouth right at the end of this. I think she spends a lot of time serving up this word lasagna, and at the end of it, she's like, oh, that was... I don't think she's pleased with herself uh, at the end of this one. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, that last one, I'm with you. It's in my notes. There's a change in her mouth at the end that is uncharacteristic, and there's a request for approval at the same time. Mm -hmm kind of that. So you can't miss that she knows she's not delivered well there. She starts off, if you notice her head movement here, remember I talked about frequency, but also how much movement she has. The The amount of movement is much lighter and much more rapid. So that's an indicator. As you said, it's an adapter. It's a way to release nervous energy. And so she's really nervous and she's frequency is moving up and the amount she's moving her head is has decreased. I love the fact she picks up his word anchors and chaffs like nobody's business. Meaning when we say chaff and redirect, we mean like a plane spraying all this chaff out the back to make a missile follow. He says something she picks up on a word commercially available or a term and she runs away with it. And when she does that, in fact, she does a little lip grip when she says commercially available. 
which means withholding information or emotion. As she gets to the message and she gets down into this chaff and redirect, then her hands start to come up and she starts to talk. She does a two-handed defense. She's doing regulators, as you were saying, Mark, to control a conversation. My favorite is I'm going to regulate you and point out how good I am at the same time. That's one of my favorites I've seen in a long time. That's a hell of a lot of arrogance to do that to somebody. When you put your hand in someone's face and then talk about yourself, that's a hell of a lot of arrogance. And that's what I got. Um, Chase, what do you got? Oh, <laughs> wow. You thought you were going to go to profundity. Oh, man, I was, I was waiting so on good. that. I was getting so good about not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, Scott. I know you have to edit all this out. Oh, yeah. You think I mean, I'm, you think I'm going to edit that out? Right, baby. <laughs> that's, that's not going anywhere, especially since you said it. <laughs> all right. This nodding that she's doing is killing me. I, I can't take this nodding behavior. So one thing that, that we see here is she is acting like a nano explainer and not just a nano tainer. <laughs> That didn't even get Scott. <laughs> I'm gonna, Scott I think get. I think I think just just carry on and see how long you can possibly hold that. Yeah, yeah that'd be good. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Call his bluff. So one thing we're seeing here that you're not going to see in a lot of the other videos is immediate mouth closure after the statement. The statement's over and the mouth closes within a tenth of a second, and she continues to dig deeper here. There's a baton gesture, which Greg, I'm not sure what you guys call that. I know you're on mute and Scott's frozen. <laughs> or or all... frozen. Yeah, illustrator, but a baton uh, is, is a, yeah. a function of illustrator. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So a baton is when we talk and our hand is at the accentuation or the right at the syllable of what we're saying. And there's a baton gesture on every single syllable here when she starts to answer this. <laughs> He's still <laughs> keep going. Call his bluff. Uh, see, see who who crumbles first. <laughs> I, I think it's unusual here that she won't speak for herself. She's uh, turning everything into this is about the company. This is not about me. And I think part of this is a diversion of guilt. That if she can make it about them and about everybody there, then she doesn't have to own it if anything ever happens. Because I'm, I'm damn sure that she's worried about this coming into light. So right at the end, again, immediate mouth closure with a confirmation glance back to the interviewer, which is not, both of those are not within her normal baseline. Scott, what do you got? <laughs> Other I than a cramp see. in your neck. Wow. No, I just yeah, yeah. can't see. Uh, do you want, do you want, shall I call the ambulance? For no, not something? yet. <laughs> I got hot chicken waiting up there. That'll wake me up when yeah. we're done. Oh, yeah. All right, this is this is a huge lie, and her blink her blink rate plummets at this point. And as as we're going as she goes through this, um she shrinks again. She shrinks and she's using her barriers. She guys cover most everything. And uh, again, I think she's had a lot of help with this because nobody can ball. F well, you can ball face lie to somebody like this if you're a psychopath. If you're if there's something wrong with your amygdala, there's something wrong with their limbic system in there. Here's why I think so. Uh, Chase. <laughs> <laughs> she can look at somebody and stare at them without blinking like I just did and not feel weird about it. What's coming out of her mouth is just, it's, it's, it's a huge lie, every bit of it. Nothing in there is true. She can't do any of that stuff. And she's looking at this guy dead-eyed and just saying like it's nothing. It's not bothering her. And having been able to do this to everyone up to this point like that, again, not caring about the health of who knows how many people that they, this would have affected. They would have found out eventually, obviously. Didn't care about that. But it doesn't bother her. As, as, as a psychopath, what happens is your amygdala don't work properly. It doesn't work properly. There's two of them. They're about the size of, of almonds, and they're about this high up, and you go in about, what is it, an inch and a half, and it, they 
come down like that, and they're either not working properly, they're not functioning properly, they're missing, or they're damaged. And that's the part of, of the limbic system that lets you have empathy for people, for little animals, for little children, for other people. When somebody hits their hand with their thumb with a hammer, you go, oh, gosh, I bet that hurt. They don't have that. So they don't know that it's weird to keep looking at you. That's the psychopathic stare. So when you see someone in a bar and they keep looking at you like this from across the room and don't quit and it makes you feel weird, it's because it doesn't make them feel weird. They don't know. They can't read the social cues in the room like a normal person can. And she can't read the social cues on this guy as she, as as he becomes uncomfortable as she continues to him. And th that's a big sign of, of that for me. That's um, in, on the, on, in the list. You go down there, they can't read. They can read some facial expressions, fear. They can read, they see that. That's the one they, they cue into. But she's not seeing fear here. She can't read what this guy's doing or what he's thinking or what other people she's talked to is, are thinking or have thought up to that point. And apparently they were believing her because of what they've mistaken for competence and her not looking away and keep dead-eyeing them at this point. Um, and then you're right there. At the end, she looks like, do you believe me? Everything's kind of changed. Like, do you believe me? That kind of face. Um, yeah, so that that's what I got. That's that's another list of reasons I think she's we're dealing with a psychopath here. See, I don't, I don't think she say? answered the question. What I don't you think, guys, I don't think she lied. Did you guys she hear my dog answer. having a nightmare back there? No. No. No, uh -uh. no. He's doing little barks. <laughs> oh. I thought it was going to ruin you, you talking. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Scott, I don't think I don't think she I don't think she told a lie. I think she just avoided answering the question. She didn't say oh, she, we can do this. She just avoided it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. She, but she doesn't see the cues on this guy to go. I wonder if she's missing everything. Watch the what to keep it keep it on the other guy as well. And she nods her head. You know how many times she nods her head coming out of the gate there in that answer? Uh, as yeah, he's man. talking to her at the beginning, fifty-eight times. Fifty-eight I know nods. It's a lot. I'm just watching. That's a hell that's a hell it's just a whole other one, two, three, four, five. Count them. Go back through and count them this time when you watch this back through. Fifty-eight times she nods her head. Yeah. Um that's just not normal. None of this is normal. For, I think for, she's uh, feeling stress is the reason she's moving her head. Yeah. Short, could be. I don't know. I don't know. I'm I don't, embarrassed. I, don't know. I didn't count. I didn't have a number at all. And you had. I this. agree with you. That's ah, Nod count. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of them. It's a lot of them. All right. Is that everybody? Yep. Let's move along. So if I went to one of the centers and I got a pinprick mm -hmm. um, and I only gave that much blood, mm -hmm. right? What tests are yeah. you currently able to perform for that blood using anything other than? commercially available lab equipment. So we have never used commercially available lab equipment for finger stick based tests. Okay. Every finger stick test that we have ever done uses proprietary Theranos technology that is not commercially available. Okay. Um, right now, because we're at a moment in time in which we've decided to transition from the lab framework to the FDA framework, I think about this kind of like if you have cars driving on a road and you say, okay, I'm gonna take everybody from driving on the right-hand side of the road to the left-hand side of the road. The only way to do that is to pause, right? Okay. Cut over. And so as a result, because we have voluntarily decided not to use our nanotainer tubes until we cut over to the left-hand side of the road, which we now have the FDA quality systems in place to do this, um, we are not collecting the finger stick sample for anything except for HSV. That Got has it. nothing to do with what we can run on our devices in our lab. Okay. It has nothing to do with our tests. It has nothing to do with our testing methodology or the accuracy or performance of it. Had a, um, an inspection by the FDA mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. Um, my understanding is it was unannounced and that they communicated with you that this was because they had some concerns with the efficacy of the data that they were seeing from some of your results. True? Um, so I have several answers to this. I mean, first, I am never going to get on stage and make comments about what the FDA thinks because it's not my place to do that. I can tell you what I can say about it, which is that we got our systems cleared uh, by FDA at the end of July. At the end of August, uh, FDA did an inspection at Theranos. The inspection was about our compliance with quality systems regulations. It was a QSR audit, which is the quality system regulation audit. Um, and that was what they focused on in the audit. Um, so 
that being conflated with, you know, is there concerns about our testing method methodology, which was what was written in the Wall Street Journal article, is just completely false. All right, Greg, what do you got? So right out of the gate, she's using something I call sacred space. And it's the first time we've seen it. Sacred space means I create a barrier to give me some space, put my hands or some object between me and you, and then I mill my fingers or thumbs. And you can see she's milling her thumbs. First time we've seen that from her. That's an indicator her stress level is up and she needs comfort. Her head bob, which we said is an adapter as well, is moving much shorter distance and much more rapidly. That really indicates that her stress levels have risen as well. So she's she knows there's a threat here. She actually blinks in this case, and she has a nervous smile at the side of her mouth when she's asked a question. Now she goes to stammer the second time we'll hear in this whole interview. And this time she goes, I, um, so I. Her blink rate goes up. She has a half smile. She goes down to inner voice. And then she says, I have several answers. And of course she does. But she's using the word I, which is rare. She usually only uses the word I for speaking. I said this, I said that. She does blame sharing, as I refer to it, using a pronoun to share cross with other people, we at every turn. And then she says, I am never going to speak for the FBA, FDA. And you see a little grief muscle in that. It's, then she goes back to her pronoun use, which is where she starts to flip back and forth to when I speak and when we do something. And she does downright when they're talking about compliance. Her eye movement goes down to the right, which I typically associate with an emotional moment. Then she sits back in her hand in the chair with her hands up as in helplessness, but her elbows are at her side. And when she says that, and we typically associate that with stress or fear. If you want to look believable, raise your elbows away from your side. And then she does some odd withdrawal of her lips and is just completely false. There's an extension before you're saying it's a lie. There's an extension before you're denying something by putting more words in and a quick lip compression. That's what I got. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, not a great deal on this, just that, you know, she does all of that work really again on her back foot. She's being pushed quite hard here um, to simply attack at the end and go, you know, you're, you're being false. It's quite it's quite bold uh, what she's saying there. But, but one thing I will add to this, because I think it's quite, kind of quite interesting, but ultimately it's a bit of kind of pop psychology. So take it with whatever you want to is I did, you know, off the top of my head, kind of run the hair test test on her, which is the hair test is the, is the psychopathy test. Again, look, there's all, you, you can go and find it on the internet and, and have a look at it. And um, it's usually administered as a bit of a self uh, test as I recall. Um, and <laughs> so there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of problems with it. But as a bit of fun, by no means any kind of of diagnosis, um, being generous to her uh, on psychopathy, she she scored a twenty six out of out of forty. So she actually didn't, in my mind, didn't score that that highly. So scores pretty well in terms of narcissist, but on the grand scheme of, of psychopath, not hugely because the hair test has all kinds of areas in it, um, you know, that you'd see in violent, violent, violent criminals, uh, uh, where, where it would become kind of sociopathic to an extent. Um, anyway, but having said that, you know, a 25 in the UK is enough. I don't know why you got to get more in in America. You don't need as high a score in the UK uh, for some reason. Now, here's where I'm going with this. If I factor in, you know, ha having hung around corporations a lot and worked in a lot of corporations, if I factor in the culture and go, I don't know whether that's her. I reckon that's probably cultural. For me, she only scores a 16. And so, again, I want to bring in this idea that you've got to look at the culture here and go, what could be cultural about, you know, telling stories like she's telling stories or lying like she's lying? And what is actually her? Because there is one train of thought that says, well, there aren't really any individuals. Uh, there's just um, groups of of people. There's culture. It's just they don't often show up with everybody else. So they look like individuals. In fact, it was Margaret Thatcher who put forward partly that, that idea. Uh, but may, she may have been sociopathic. Anyway, that was just because uh, I've got not, not much else to say on this. Uh, Chase, what do you got on it? Yeah, and the, uh, the hair test is one of the only diagnostic criteria we have. If you 
look in the hold on if you look in this book here it's the dsm this is how we diagnose or people diagnose mental disorders or psychiatric disorders there's no psychopath in here there's no sociopath in this book so the hair test is one of the closest things we have and the biggest criticism of the hair test is that it, it places an excessive or unusual amount of weight on criminal activity specifically and we're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to walk you through the hair test. That was my plan for this video. Nice. To walk through the hair <laughs> test and maybe I'll get into a fight with Scott. <laughs> but uh, in this video, she nods to confirm what the FDA said. She's nodding in confirmation to what the FDA said. And she speaks for herself, but only to tell you what she won't talk about. And the interviewer did not ask what the FDA thinks. He asked what they said. And she responds, I'm not going to tell you what they think. And then she goes back to team pronouns. Eyebrows are raised constantly. There's nodding constantly throughout the whole thing. And this fake voice gets even deeper at the end of the clip. And uh, I think the, the diagnostic term for this is creepy as hell uh, for me, according to me. Scott? Yeah, that's a little technical. But I can go with that. Sorry. Um, yeah. So we'll get it. If we're going to get in the hair test, I'll, I'll I'll save all my stuff for that. Um, at the end of her sentences, they all go up like she's giving facts. This is classic to I mean to the max. She's she's trying to sell this guy like she sold everybody else on this. Here's what we do. This is why it works. This is the this and this is the that. They said this. We believe this. And like she's laying them out like they're facts. And looking at the guy like these are facts. And they're not. And um that she's gotta have nerves of steel to be able to do this with with a straight face like that. Semi straight because she is getting a little bit of a smile in there. You call that duping delight delight if you want to. I don't know though. That that's in this case I don't I don't think it, it plays in that. Um her illustrators are they go out, they get a little they get a little bit wider as she gets into her her, her um she's a con is what she is. So she's as she begins conning, they get a little bit wider as she's trying to sell this guy. And um uh, the antisocial behavior that we're seeing here that that is in, in the DSM is the part where, she, again, she cannot read this guy's uh, facial expressions or the emotions going on with this guy as he's looking at her. And there's not there's not tons there, but there's enough to go. He doesn't believe me. You know, she can she, she's got an idea that he doesn't believe her because of the question, obviously. But, I, but she can't she can't see that on him. She can't read it. So I think that's what we're, we're seeing at that point. Had a. Um an inspection by the FDA mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. Um, my understanding is it was unannounced and that they communicated with you that this was because they had some concerns with the efficacy of the data that they were seeing from some of your results. True? Um, so I have several answers to this. I mean, first, I am never going to get on stage and make comments about what the FDA thinks because it's not my place to do that. I can tell you what I can say about it, which is that we got our systems cleared uh, by FDA at the end of July. At the end of August, uh, FDA did an inspection at Theranos. The inspection was about our compliance with quality systems regulations. It was a QSR audit, which is the quality system regulation audit. Um, and that was what they focused on in the audit. Um, so that being conflated with you know, is there concerns about our testing method methodology, which was what was written in the Wall Street Journal article, is just completely false. Surely you can describe what they communicated to you about why they came for that inspection. They told us that they were here because we're now FDA regulated. They wanted to learn more about our work and they wanted to understand our compliance with the quality system. Would that have been an unannounced visit to do just that? It was unannounced. I mean, I'm, I'm not FDA, you know, mm -hmm. but I read what was written in the article. Uh, we disagree with it. We think it was false and we think it was misleading. Um, I know what we've done, which is the decision to voluntarily work with the agency. We interact with them all the time. Um, we've chosen to take a path that is hard, and I believe in it incredibly strongly because it's the right thing to do. 
And I personally, in Arizona, worked very hard to change the law to allow individuals the right to order lab tests directly. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that without knowing that the tests that are offered are of the highest quality. So we decided, yeah, this is hard. And yeah, this means we need to transition. And yes, it means there's going to be a pause period as we do this with all these tests and systems. But what an amazing thing that people are going to be able to use technology that's been regulated in this way. Right. And so we're going to do it. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, nothing on body language here, just the narrative that she's putting forward, which I think is is really interesting. There's three characters, I think, here. There's the FDA, there's the Wall Street Journal, and there's we, so her and Theranos. Um, here's how she describes the FDA. The FDA learn, they understand, they're unannounced, they're regulatory, and they're an agency. Is any of that good? I mean, do you? when I describe that character, do you go, oh, that sounds really good to me? Um, the Wall Street journal, she says, are false and misleading. That's all she says about that character. False and misleading. Anything positive there? So we got these two characters here, FDA and Wall Street Journal. Uh, FDA are having to learn stuff. They need to understand. They come in unannounced. They're regulators and they're an agency, uh, you know, unannounced regulatory agency just coming. Wall Street Journal, false and misleading. Now we, we, her and Theranos, are compliant. They think they they're regulated, they're voluntary, they're interactive, they choose the hard path, they believe uh, in the right thing. They're hardworking, individual, direct, high quality decision making, uh, you know, uh, transitioning, amazing, pausing, and technology. I mean, there's a lot of really good stuff in there, but how brilliantly she's cast these three characters and, and what does she talk most about? Now, again, you, you can make all kinds of, you know, diagnosis around that and you'd be right to, why not? Why not? Why not do that? But also you'd have to look at her, you know, if Kata, if she was on your side, she'd be quite handy to have on your side because she did a very good job there of clearly casting these three characters here and very quickly in our minds delivering, you know, two villains and a hero in this. So actually, you know, nice corporate communication there um, if she was on on your side and on the right side. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, she'd be great to have if you're in a, in a pinch for the one time because she can get you out of the fight, but whether she'd win the war or not, obviously in this case, she's not going to win the war, but she can definitely get you out of that scrap really fairly easily. She's got nerves of steel in this. Uh, her posture is much better here, actually, you know, as she goes along. And her voice starts higher, but it begins to go lower. She gets deeper and deeper into this. Um, and it's wee, wee, wee. Then it's I, I, I. As you go along, you've covered all this, Mark. And, um, she tells the story of a hero, and she's the hero. That's it. And she tells about her troops, which are all these people. That is, that's the we part. Is we're doing this, and I think I, I, and that's the right thing to do. You know, this is I, I can't. This is this is a malignant narcissist at this point. No violence in her background. I don't. I'm not aware of any drug use or anything like that in her back background. Those are bit, those are a, a big part of the hair test as well. I'm not aware of any of that. But everything else to me seems like it's, it's lining up. Chase, what do you got? There is a book called The Secret Life of Pronouns. Yeah. And I forgot the author. And I, I wish I could remember. I know he was at the University of Texas. I have it on my Kindle. <laughs> but it's a fabulous book. And one cool thing in this book is that leaders are more likely to use the term I instead of we. And I would have thought the opposite was true. So good leaders will use I more often. <clears throat> just wanted to throw that out there. So now we're seeing her nodding again. This is just, a, I think, a compulsive behavior derived from years of scamming out some investors and, and having to develop rapport. And as a side note, psychopaths don't see themselves as psychopaths. They most often don't know that they're psychopaths and they see themselves as having a deficit versus other people because they don't see themselves as different from other people. They see themselves as, oh crap, those other people have everything figured out and I don't. 
and I need to figure it out as fast as possible. I don't know if Scott, you'll agree with me on that or not, but uh, I I agree with you completely because they, James Pennebaker, that's the guy, that's the author. That's it. Um, So what happens is when they find out, they usually find out in their early to mid twenties and they'll live in, they'll live in a city somewhere. There's a lot of action going on. You don't find many psychopaths in little small towns. They're there, but, but once they, once they get that, that know they've got to go somewhere. The action is they'll move, let's say, to Nashville, for example. And I always, always use this as the example. They would move to Nashville and they'd live like on Second Avenue where all the action is. And because it gives them, that's one of the few things that gives them feeling is sex, drugs, and then action, things going on, their adrenaline, their adrenaline system will goose them sometimes and give them something. So they would get a place to live like down on Second Avenue in a loft or something. And it would be Friday night. And it would be, Oh, around supper time, and they'd say, "Well, I'm going to go down and get something to eat. I'm going to go eat Chinese food." And they go down the street, and they start walking down the street, and, and about halfway down, they see ambul- an ambulance, see a bunch of police cars. There's a lot going on. A bunch of people huddled, huddled around down there. And as they got closer to this, they'd see they knew they would know something important's happening, but they're not really sure why. Why? What's making it important? They get closer and closer as they come up on it. There's a little child that's run been run over by a car, and it's obviously passed away. And the mother's over the child crying and screaming and hollering and, you know, my baby, all that kind of business. And the psychopath sees this and it says, sweet and sour chicken. I'm going to do sweet and sour chicken. And goes on and gets sweet and sour chicken and comes back home, get back home and eats it. Right? Has sweet and sour chicken. After that, about two hours later, maybe an hour, hour, two hours later, they're in the bathroom looking in the mirror, trying to mimic those expressions they saw on the mother because they don't know what those are. They've seen them before, but they know they're important because everyone was focused on that person while they were making these expressions. That's when it starts dawning on them, something's not right here. I don't fit in. I've got to pretend like I know what's going on and learn what all these things, these things. Uh, expressions that, that these people make and the things they say, I've got to learn about those. And I'm, so I'll know what they are and I'll fit in with everyone else. They do the same thing with language. They'll hear people get upset. For example, there was a guy that, that I knew that was one, didn't know he was one until this happened. One time I was at, we were at a social gathering and we were talking about taxes and I was, I was going on, I was like, damn it, taxes. You know, you have to pay, you do all this work and you got to pay the half your taxes, da, da, da. And months later, I'm in a, I'm in, I'm in this uh, restaurant downtown, you know, during the day, my, I had a meeting there and in the table behind us, we're in a place called the Palm and they, in, in the bar area there, you can get in and eat lunch and get out. But there was somebody sitting behind me and I recognized the voice and they were saying the exact same thing I was when I was carrying on about taxes. He was saying, damn it, taxes. I can't believe this. You got to pay all that. I was matching what I said because he doesn't, he didn't understand that the emotions I'm showing were, were, he doesn't know, he doesn't have those feelings. So he has to show everybody he has feelings. So he mimics those and you'll see him mimic crying and mimic, um, getting angry about things where normally other things would make him angry, getting uh, angry about things. They don't understand why they should get angry about just to show other, other people they're normal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did I go on too long? No, it was great. Okay. Good. Let, right. let me wrap and I'll, I'll just oh. throw it throw it back. Okay. Every facial expression in this whole entire clip is fake. It's all fake. And here's a quick master class. I would not call this a master class. You could fit this on a post-it note. But here's how to tell a fake versus a real facial expression. There's a couple of ways to do it, but here's a a very powerful one. If you see a facial expression instantly disappear from the person's face, it's most likely fake. True facial expressions will tend to fade away because you don't have to think about making a facial expression. So it comes from a very different part of your brain than faking it. She refers to herself again to say what she can't do. And there's one more self-reference again about how she worked hard to change the law. I think that's truthful. I think she was trying to change that law. And there's a self-reference again to this decision to work with the FDA. And I think it's hilarious that this giant government organization, what did they really want to do? They wanted to come and learn from her company. So what she's really saying here, I'm kind of doing a Bowdoin on this, but what she's saying here is that she's a teacher. 
now I am teaching this giant government agency with my ideas and my intelligence. I am so smart. This government agency, yeah, this surprise inspection was, I, I had to teach them. They wanted me to come, they wanted to come out here so I could teach them about all this new technology, which is uh, insane. Scott? Yeah. Well, I think I went, I went earlier. Did no, I go earlier? Not. I think I did. I was been ranting the whole time. I've lost <laughs> track of time. Who, right, who's Mark, that? Mark, what do you got? Uh, I've been. Uh, we think it must oh, be uh, right. Greg. Right. Yeah. All right, guys. Greg. Yeah. So, so guys, at this point, yes, I agree that all of this stuff is crafted. I think everything we're seeing is crafted. Everything about this young woman is crafted from the bobbing her head and all of that to bending over to crossing her legs this way. Everything is crafted. Mark, probably a character you could have drawn up in, you know, when you're teaching people to act. And Scott, I don't think she has nerves of steel. I think she has an act and she's acting and she's hiding behind that act. And it allows her to get away with some of this because I do see her get nervous. I do see that even though she's doing this, I don't think that she controls the speed or the frequency at which she moves her head. I think that is a nervous behavior because she's gotten to the point, you said it best, Chase, she's done it so long that it's an innate part of who she is. When she gets to the point that she has something to regurgitate, she does. She spits out this information about what the FDA did and that was probably prepared by a comms person in her company. Remember, this is a big company, this is not her. And she does a request for approval to see how she's perceived there. She sits up more rigidly than she has in the past and she stops illustrating. And when she stops illustrating is when I start to think, hmm, something's up here. She adapts at her knee and she gets this kind of odd look we haven't seen yet with a full toothy smile and a nervous laugh and a flat forehead with kind of a deer in the headlights look. And when she does that, she, does, she says something like, it was unannounced. She doesn't know what to say. That nervous laugh comes out, and then she goes to that high holy ground piece. You said it, you both talked about her self-aggrandizing and saying, look, I fought for this. I did this. I was trying to protect you, poor bastards. That's holy ground, that's higher. Bill Clinton, when he said, I didn't have sexual relations with that woman, he said, now I got work to do for the American people, and turned and walked away. There you go. That's what we're seeing here. I think this is carefully crafted, and we're seeing cracks in it is what I think when we see all this behavior. And she has facial expressions intended to send a message. They don't always send the message that she's trying to send. The only thing I got a problem with that is I don't think her ego let her take instruction from anybody. I don't think she'd sit there and, and have somebody say, act like this, do this, do that. I don't think oh, she no, I don't mean that. that. I mean, a carefully crafted, crafted message on what she oh. should say about the FDA. Because, I, I mean, I know I've known some pretty bold CEOs who might check a few boxes, even they are going to go, hey, when I get in a bind, this is regulatory, what should I say? That's okay. all I, mean. I got you, I agree with that. Surely you can describe what they communicated to you about why they came for that inspection. They told us that they were here because we're now FDA regulated. They wanted to learn more about our work and they wanted to understand our compliance with the quality system. Would that have been an unannounced visit to do just that? It was unannounced. I mean, I'm, I'm not FDA, you know, mm -hmm. but I read what was written in the article. Uh, we disagree with it. We think it was false and we think it was misleading. Um, I know what we've done, which is the decision to voluntarily work with the agency. We interact with them all the time. Um, we've chosen to take a path that is hard and I believe in it incredibly strongly because it's the right thing to do. And I personally, in Arizona, worked very hard to change the law to allow individuals the right to order lab tests directly. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that without knowing that the tests that are offered are of the highest quality. So we decided, yeah, this is hard. And yeah, this means we need to transition. And yes, it means there's gonna be a pause period as we do this with all these tests and systems. But what an amazing thing that people are gonna be able to use technology that's been regulated in this way. Right. And so we're gonna do it. Okay. I, I have to ask you, right, you have, sure. you have two so pretty iconic technologists. These are not just yeah. average patients. Yeah. Um, and in John Louis Gasset's case, yeah. he actually blogged about his results. He actually put them up there, yeah. effectively waiving all of his privacy. Sure. Um, and he expressed concern about um, the variations that he saw. Yeah. Uh, and said that he got no response from the company. 
Um, yeah, I mean, and just it, on that quickly, yeah, okay. he said he wrote me a letter, right. and unfortunately, I personally did not receive this letter. I wish he'd called our call center, which is what exists to be able to serve people in terms of explaining if we have different reference ranges or you know different um, different ways we report our results. We absolutely are going to follow up with him now that we're aware of this, and um, and we've we've done we've done over 3.5 million tests, right? So to take five of them out of context mm -hmm. is just misleading. All right, Chase, what do you got? This interviewer is obviously nervous asking these questions. You can see fearful body language with this uh, getting close to a confrontation. And if she was not on message, I think that she would have probably taken advantage of this by using his name and maybe leaning in like that would have shut him down at that point. And he would not have asked any follow-up questions, especially if she did a Mattis knife hand. Go Mattis. She throws out this stop gesture and he gives in right away. And eyebrows are raised. She sits up in her chair with this uh, artificial smile. There's self-reference again about inability, inability. And uh, he didn't, this guy didn't just write a letter. Uh, I'm, sh I'm positive they saw it online and <laughs> they didn't reach out, but she's visualizing this follow-up when she says, Oh, now that we've learned about this here on stage, and I've never seen this blog post uh, in the history of the world. Now I'm going to follow up. She's visualizing the stress of this follow-up. You can see her, her head goes down, her eyes are downcast and she's maybe strategizing about it. But uh, when, when she says out of context, uh, he said the same context in the beginning of the question. The, the patients were, were the context. The patients were outliers themselves in the field and not just these discrepancies. The discrepancies were not the outlier. The patients were the outlier. And that's all I got uh, on this one. Greg? Yeah, so she starts off lean back in the chair, which is something we haven't seen with her yet. Then her eyes are a little more closed than normal, and she has a closed mouth smile. Something's up here. She's sensing this chance that something's going to go the wrong way. And she actually shows what I think is her true colors. We can see something boiling up and see human emotion coming up in her because she exposes her lower teeth, very clearly exposes her lower teeth in this one, the only time we've seen it. And then she closes her mouth, and she pulls the sides of her mouth down, and that regulator goes up, that hand out, like, hold on, I got something to say. That's a let me talk as clearly as there is anything. We've seen her use it twice now. She sets up, she sits up in the chair and her chin comes up in that defiant kind of move. And then she goes and she starts down the process and she said, if he, I wish he would have given me a call. That's a clear line. Yes, this expert is no better than any other customer. That's what she's saying right here. When she says, I wish he would have given me a call. That's what the customer line is set up for. She's just pushing him back. Then she starts talking about, she uses some jargon again, insulating herself and numbers. And she starts spewing out a, the volume of numbers they've done. And she minimizes his expertise clearly by saying, and he's only five data points in all of this data. Never mind, he's one of the two people that he calls out for being the most respected. I think I see not rage because there's no rage in this person showing, but I see fa the facade cracking here and some of who she is coming out. Hold on, this guy is just one of you. He doesn't mean anything and he's only five data points is what I hear when I listen to this. Uh, yeah, so I, I see the same stuff. She raises herself to full height, she moderates. Uh, this is kind of, I think, uh, about as aggressive as she, as she gets, which is quite aggressive because um, she frames this technology writer as what I would term a, a Luddite. So somebody who doesn't use technology and hates technology because she frames him as delivering a letter. Now, I don't think any of us think he actually posted a letter, but that's the way she kind of frames it is, look, here's somebody who's meant to know about technology. They sent me a letter uh, about this thing. Um, and it just misleading. And so that's a beautiful framing there. Very hard for this interviewer to come back on. Um, it, it's a difficult interviewer to Trump, but I think she's managed managed to, to do it. Um, so again, really quite 
skillful in in many ways i would like her on my side uh now and again just as you say scott uh the problem if we are dealing with um uh something psychopathic in nature here is and I, and i believe it's in the in the in the hair test uh is is that parasitic nature is that they move from group to group to group they they can suck the the resource out of it, it can be very useful and that's the important thing very useful for a society for a for a short space of time until that society realizes that they're actually going to suck the resource out of out of them and not the enemy uh, and so then they'll be dethroned and, and cast out and then they'll move uh, on to another group. Um, anyway, that's all I've got for you on that one. There you go. All right. I, I have to ask you, right? You have, sure. you have two sort of pretty iconic technologists. These are not just yeah. average patients. Yeah. Um, and in Jean-Louis Gasset's case, yeah. he actually blogged about his results. He actually put them up there, yeah. effectively waiving all of his privacy. Sure. Um, and he expressed concern about um, the variations that he saw yeah. uh, and said that he got no response from the company. Um, yeah, I mean, and just it, on that quickly, yeah, okay. he said he wrote me a letter. Right. And unfortunately, I personally did not receive this letter. I wish he'd called our call center, which is what exists to be able to serve people in terms of explaining if we have different reference ranges or you know different um, different ways we report our results we absolutely are going to follow up with him now that we're aware of this and um, and we've we've done we've done over 3.5 million tests right so to take five of them out of context mm -hmm. is just misleading all right well let's roll around the room one time and in 30 seconds or less Let's see what we think is going on here. And uh, we'll go with Mark, Chase, Greg, and then I'll wrap it up. Mark? Yeah, so I was lucky enough once to work with one of Britain's most renowned confidence tricksters. And lovely guy, fantastic guy. Again, you wouldn't want to be on the wrong side, but he, but he let me know how not to be on the wrong side. He said, Mark, you can only con a greedy man. Or woman. He didn't use the word woman at the time, uh, but I think he was talking about everybody. And he was saying the reason that it's called confidence trick is not because he's confident, it's because he makes you confident. That's the, the skill of the confidence trickster. The confidence trickster will work out very, very quickly what you are greedy for, and they will deliver you that, and you won't be able to see it because you, you yearn for that thing so much. Other people around you will go, well, that's too good to be true. And what you'll do is go, no, not this time. Like, this is the moment. This is the time. I think we've got a confidence trickster here and 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 the reason is and the reason is because the the investors here as scott you were saying you know they're looking for their 20x they're not so much more they want so much but they want an amazon they want they want something which is there are some investments that you can make which will blow your mind as to, as to what you put in and what you can get at the end they want one of those and it's worth it's worth believing the lie just in case this is the time this is the moment you got one of those that's the beauty of it so you know what i would say to everybody out there is check out what do you think you're greedy for when somebody walks up to you and starts offering you that check yourself <laughs> you know check it out and if everybody around you is going that's too good to be true and you're going no 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 this is the one this is the time check yourself uh chase what do you got on this one it's like it reminds me of the time i bought a sham wow <laughs> <laughs> I felt the you same get way. I went all in. One? Yeah. Oh man. It came with free ones too. <laughs> of course I did. But let, let's let's talk about this hair checklist really quick. So there's two main factors on the list. The list is separated into two factors. We have uh, these interpersonal and affective factors. And the second part is social deviance. And some of those are uh, like a need for constant stimulation, uh, what Mark was just talking about, this parasitic lifestyle. But there's a lack of realistic long-term goals. There's impulsivity. There's irresponsibility. But for the 
for the final phase here, which is called antisocial factors, there's poor behavioral control, there's uh, early behavioral problems, juvenile delinquency, uh, criminal versatility, and a couple other ones that don't really fall into those, which are promiscuous sexual activity and short-term marital relationships, repetitive short-term relationships. So I think that she doesn't necessarily fall into the second factor for two reasons. One, because uh, we don't really see a lot of evidence for this in her present lifestyle. Number two, we don't have access to a lot of her historical behavioral data. Uh, so it would be harder for us to say that we can uh, we can see uh, visibly that a person like this, of course, not her, would be would be diagnosed as a narcissist or would be considered to have uh, narcissistic behavioral traits and uh Scott? Well, let's go to Greg. So I'll, I'll bring it to the end. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go. All right. Um, I agree with both you guys on this so far. Mark, she's a con. That's one of my, that's, that's, that's in my wheelhouse as well. I love them. Can't get enough of them. Um, but that's because that's all she's doing. The goal here is an impossible goal to reach. She should know that she can, this doesn't work. It sounds like it's going to work. And, and you're right, Mark. That's how she gets the confidence with him. Because when we were talking about, I said, look, man, she's got a thing where one drop of blood can tell you all this stuff. Makes sense to me. All he needs a drop. Why would you need all that stuff? The way things are going tech, technology-wise, all those things. So it makes it sounds like it would make sense to do that. But the goal is unreachable. She knows that goal is unreachable. However, she keeps going and going and going and going and going because she wants it all. She wants as much as she can possibly get. Um, psychopaths, were, uh, they, they believe, were part of the reason. F oh, well, I'm not going to go down. The, the 2008 uh, stock market thing. There's a book called Snakes in Suits. Read that book. It's awesome. Um, that would be 40 minutes on that. But, Mark, you nailed it on that. And, Chase, you did as well. Lots of, lots of psychopaths are cons. And, and most of the time they are the hardcore long-term con. A lot of times they'll be most of the time they are a psychopath to add that in there too, as well. Um, uh, yeah, that's where I'll, that's where I'll stop. I, Cause I, again, I could go on forever on this stuff and it'd just be boring as hell, but I think we're dealing with a con and I think she knows that the goal is unreachable, but she's gathering as much as she can possibly gather. And I think she's in so far. She's just got to keep going and see what happens and see as long as she can keep from getting in trouble. Usually the con will go to another town or another country. In this case, she's got no way out. She's painted herself into a corner that she cannot get out of. And I agree with you, Chase. There's, we don't see any... Uh, Situa that situation, whether it was background sexually or drug abuse or, um, have, you know, a lot of times if it's a guy, they'll have kids all over the place uh, and, and be violent to their mate as well. We don't we're not seeing that. However, you do see psychopaths who will le lead a, a normal life because their upbringing, all they see is normal behavior. They see loving behavior and all that. So they try to blend in and be, and be that way. And for some reason, thank God, they don't have that that thing that makes them want to hurt people, hurt their family members and those types of things. Um, there's some debates about that, as you know, but right now it's, it, the thought is some of them don't do go down that way because of the way they're raised. Um, Greg, what do you got? Yeah. Some will go in an entirely different direction. Yeah. She might be a psychopath. Remember all of that is putting things in a circle, drawing a circle around a bunch of behaviors and calling it something. A hair would tell you that we label that. Humans are complex messes of chemistry. What makes us who we are, some of it's genes, some of it's behavior, some of it's exposure, some of it's trauma, all of those kinds of things make us whoever we are. I'm not even gonna bother with that. What you need to be able to do is to pay attention to the fact that even someone who is very good at being deceptive still shows signs. This person has a very clear, you called it a mask, Scott, because I know that's what we talk about with psychopaths. Let's just call it an act. She, this could be a, a Yeti suit, whatever you want to call it, because this is more than a mask. This is a carefully crafted person who has made it past many people. And here's the organism doing what the what made the organism successful. So I've talked to Kissinger. He believes me. Now suddenly I've got clout. I talked to Mattis. He believes me. Now I've got more clout. Well, they're going to keep doing what they did that worked until somebody discovers that it didn't. And if a person is never put on notice, this is the emperor's new clothes, guys. If you never ask a person, 
whether they're lying, if you never put them on the hot seat, when they get on the hot seat, they're still going to leak. Now, she's so care carefully crafted. Mark, I think it's a stage act. I think it's mm -hmm. exactly somebody playing a character forever. If you were to find one of the guys who played a character for 50 years, you know, some soap opera, they, they're probably as part of that in that person. And only when you break through all of that past the facade, do you start to get to the person. What we're seeing here is that. We're seeing where she actually starts to show some signs that something has gotten to her, where she stammers and stutters, which we haven't seen much. So what we want you to know, what I want you to know, is that it works on everyone. You can't hide this part of who you are. Your, your body is going to communicate things that you can't plan to do, no matter how polished a psychopath you are. And I'll leave it at that. I want you to look for people, regardless of what you want to call them or label them, look for these deviations. Are you saying that your ego's writing checks that your body can't cash? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter Very what nice you do. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. All right. Just take well, the right like pressure. What, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. Right down there where Mark is pointing, you see that little YouTube thing, click that, and there'll be a little bell that pops up and click that, and I'll let you know. When, and so you'll know when we have something new that comes out. So please subscribe. And we just got 400,000 subscribers this week. So thank you very much, uh, everyone who's still thank subscribed you. and still watching to this late in the game uh, for this video. So there you have yeah. it. All right, fellas, this is a good one, and we'll yeah. see you next time. See, see you next week. I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know.